Most of us all know Mr. Dunba as a retired member of the Universal House of Justice, the supreme governing body of the Baha'i Faith. However, Mr. Dunba has served the beloved cause tirelessly well before that. He selflessly pioneered to Nicaragua and Central America, where soon by Mr. Dunba served as a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Nicaragua from its inception in 1961. Serving on this National Spiritual Assembly, he was able to represent that NSA at the very first international convention in Haifa, Israel in 1963. Soon after, he was appointed to serve as an auxiliary board member for the protection of the faith and then as a counselor for the next five years after that, serving the Americas. In 1973, Mr. Dunbar then took up residency in Israel in Haifa, when he was named as one of the founding members of the International Teaching Center. Mr. Dumba served as a member of the International Teaching Center for 15 years until he was then elected to serve on the Supreme Body of the Universal House of Justice. Mr. Dumba served the beloved Universal House of Justice for 22 more years after that. There are no words to describe the sacrifice and the tireless uh, service and efforts in all of your services of the faith across the world. However, amongst all of this service, Mr. Dunbar also had another particular passion and area of interest, and that was the deepening of the youth. I'm sure there are many youth in the audience here today, and probably a lot more adults who not too long ago used to be youth, that used to serve at the Baha'i World Center, and very fondly remember rushing home from service just to attend Thursday night youth talk by Mr. Dumbo. These youth classes ran for 30 years without interruption. Your dedication to this faith, as well as your contribution to the deepening of our youth, is truly an inspiration. So Mr. Dumbo, from the bottom of our hearts, we warmly welcome you to Brisbane and we thank you for showering your inspiration and your love on all of us one more time tonight. Good evening and aloha pa. You've done a lovely job of presentation. It reminded me of when Ravia Khanum said that she thought the worst office in the Baha'i Faith was chairman of large meetings, especially where they were introducing her. Because she said, I was always trying to concentrate on saying something useful to the friends, and then I'd hear this rehearsal of all of my greatness and all, or whatever people were saying and it would distract her from her plan. She also told me, but that was never a problem because she said, I made thorough notes of everything I was going to say. And she said, when I'd get up, I would never use, I never used the notes once in my whole life. I spoke spontaneously to the people. And the, she said, but I had to have the notes just in case I ran out of Things to say. <laughs> Which, knowing we have gone on, I doubted was ever going to happen, and it never did happen. <laughs> Friends, you know that I think they've called, what's it tonight saying? It's about service and the divine plan. Is that the, the title? Crete? <laughs> you want both? I think this is supposed to be working. Are you hearing? Yes. Can everybody hear, Mona? Okay, I'll try to say something useful then. <laughs> it's good here. Service in the divine plan, uh, I mean, the origins of that go way back 
as we know, to the centenary now we just recently had of the revealing of the divine plan. The Master revealed these tablets during <coughs> very dark years of the First World War. And up to that time, of course, he had traveled across America and visited Canada and so on, but no one had any idea that the American friends would be particularly uh, invested with responsibilities to carry out the divine plan. The tablets were finally able to be carried. They couldn't be sent in the mail. Although one, one tablet of the divine plan, Abdul Baha wrote it, had it written out on a postcard, front and back. And that got through the censors and all the, the different things that would block the delivery of mail. But then, as you may recall, you might not think, no, except from history, you recall that the ships that were in the Atlantic were being uh, torpedoed and sinking. So lots of mail got lost. So Abdul Baha held back sending these tablets to America until 1919 after the war. Then he sent one of his secretaries as his representative to deliver these in a convention in New York. And in that convention, which was called the unveiling of the divine plan, Rhea Khanum said that she was present on that occasion and there were easels with the framed tablets. There were 14 of these tablets and they were all laid out and they all had curtains in front of them. So actually it was a literal unveiling. And some of the young girls in the community would go and they would da 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 and they would open the tablet <laughs> and then they would talk about the tablet, the translation and so on. And Rhea Khanum said, I was one of those little girls. <laughs> Friends, that was such a bounty all those years, you know, the teaching center, Rhea Khanum was on the teaching center, all the hands when they were in the Holy Land were on the teaching center, but we had four hands there on a permanent basis and three counselors at the beginning in 1973. And Rhea Khanum was there and also Janabi Furitan, Mr. Furitan and Mr. Fazy and Mr. Haney. Those four hands of the cause were the kind of, they were also called the hands in the Holy Land. They reviewed cases of uh, both expulsion and, forgi and forgiveness with respect to the believers around the world. And it was, you know, marvelous. They'd had this experience of being so close with Shoghi Effendi. And uh, it was a terrific experience. So he heard lots of little stories from Rio Gano. I remember she asked me at one stage, she said, Hooper, are you writing a diary? I said, no, Gano, I'm not. Two months later, she asked, are you writing a diary, Hooper? Those things were going on, you know, pretty exciting in the teaching center. <laughs> Stories coming in from different places, problems of people. I mean, it was Finally, she asked me a third time. She said, I hope I'm really, are you writing a diary? Are you keeping a diary? I said, no, Kano. I said, it's hard enough to live it without writing it down. <laughs> and she smiled because she understood that, <laughs> exactly what that was about. And she didn't ask me that again. <laughs> so these divine plans then became known to this first convention in the, in the beginning. Martha Root was present there. May Maxwell was present there. All the outstanding believers in the Americas and in Canada were present for this unveiling of the divine plan. The immediate response, I was, you can imagine, if you've read the tablets of the divine plan, you realize how overwhelming the orders that Abdul Baha had placed in this in these tablets, instructions they had. First, worldwide, all the places the Baha'is should go and open to the faith. And then, section by section of the United States itself, and then Canada, and Greenland, and Alaska, all these places were mentioned. So the friends had to absorb that a little bit. Not Martha Root. Martha Root arose, and very shortly after the, that convention, she boarded a ship to South America. 
And she was the first Baha'i to reach that continent. She traveled down the eastern coast. And I don't know if you've read accounts of it. This is extraordinary. You know, she said that the ship stopped to unload things and leave some passengers and have some more passengers. She said she would go ashore. She knew English and she knew some French. She'd usually go to try to find the mayor and say that she was passing with this ship, but she had a very important message for the city. And there's a, several accounts of where the mayor said, all right, we'll organize something, you know, right away. And they sent announcements all through the city, and within three, four hours, they had a meeting, a huge meeting, in which she would proclaim the Baha'i teachings, and the newspapers would be there, and they would write it down. Just really, I mean, extraordinary response to what Abdul Baha had asked. She got down to uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina, and then she wanted to go on to Chile, but she found out there was a terrific huge mountain range in the middle. We didn't have planes flying over it. And she undertook, she went to the, to the Mendoza, which is the, the foothills of the Andes, and she w joined a pack mule and horse team that was going to cross, I don't know, I, don't know, I think it was four or five days, crossing the Andes. I mean, the, the highest mountain in the Americas is, that, is very close by there. It was cold. She said the animals would trip. It was a very rough um, trail, could fall down, you know, down into the abyss on, at any moment. She said, I really tired Baha'u'llah out with shouting, Ya Baha'u'llah, Baha, Ya Baha'u'llah, Baha. <laughs> Then she got to Chile and proclaimed the faith there in several meetings and found finally a ship going up the west coast of South America. But the uh, west coast, there was a number of places that had uh, epidemic illnesses so that the, boat, the people on the boat couldn't go ashore. So she would send messages to the newspapers as best she could, but she wasn't able to do a lot there. She came back through the Panama Canal, went back to New York. In New York, she announced in the meetings about what, she, what had happened in South America. And a dear, uh, dear young woman who had been studying uh, Latin languages, her name was Leonora Halsapel, later became Leonora Halsapel Armstrong. And dear Leonora was a very timid, shy woman, but Martha Root was insisting someone needed to follow her in her footsteps and stay in South America and teach these people that she'd awakened, so to speak, to the faith. Well, Leonora was, I think, about 22 at that time. She went to see May Maxwell, who happened to be a bit ill in bed that day, and she told her this story about, you know, Martha Root is asking for somebody to go, and she has a copy of her diary she's ready to give to whoever goes with all the addresses and information about the people so they can follow through with this work. And I don't know, I was, I mean, I don't think I'm worthy, but I, I could go, you know, I'm, so May Maxwell, she said, sat straight up in bed and she said, what are you waiting for, Leonora? <laughs> and Leonora, with some help from her family, some of whom were Baha'is, her father wasn't, but he helped pay the way for her to take this ship down to, down to Rio. She decided to pioneer in Brazil. Well, it took a long time for her to get down there. I mean, the ship went s slowly. She was able to visit a pl few places along the way. And the address of the man that she was going to see, who Martha Root said was the most enthusiastic, he lived in Santos instead of Rio. So she'd gotten off in Rio, and then she found out she had to take another boat to get to Santos. And 
She had about funds for about two weeks of food and things. Really heroic. I mean, you think you would head off to, you know, it wasn't like you could just fly back in case you didn't like it or something. Now she got to Santos and she asked about this man and everybody knew him and she met him and he immediately welcomed her and hired her as an English tutor for his children. That was all very interesting. A few months later, a tablet of the master reached Leonora. I've, I've seen the tablet. It says, Leonora Hall Seppel, Miss Leonora Hall Seppel, Brazil. <laughs> Abbas Effendi, Abbas, Abdul Baha Abbas. Well, what kind of master we had? He just sent it there like that. Well, they got this in the post office in Rio, and they said, well, this is obviously it's an English woman, and they sent it to the British Embassy, and the British Embassy said, we never heard of her, we don't know who she is. They sent it to the American Embassy, they said, well, we never heard of her either. And they, but she said, they said, we'll post it on our bulletin board. Not too many days after the, it was posted on the bulletin board, one of the people who had heard about the faith on the boat coming down from North America said, oh, she's gone on to Santos. So they sent this letter on to the U.S. consul in Santos, and he knew who she was, and she gets this letter from Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha says he's praying for her. He praises her, and he says, I'm praying for you that you may become a nurse to heal the diseases of self and passion of the souls of that great continent. Her story is just amazing. I came along, you know, Johnny, Johnny come lately, much decades later. <laughs> she was already there in the time of Abdul Baha, as you can tell from having received the tablet. So she was a pioneer that bridged the heroic age of the faith with the formative age. When I finally met her, probably 63, 64, 65 maybe, 1965, uh, I asked her about her activities and how things had gone, and she said, oh, I'm not able to do very much. You know, I'm so glad you people have come. You'll be able to do much more than I did. Okay, where, what, what did you do? She said, well, I, could. I, I, I visited different cities, and I spoke to crowds of people and told them about the faith and so on. She said, then Jogi Vindi encouraged me, and he said, he wanted me to translate the kitab e gone into Spanish and Portuguese, both. She said, well, I knew some Portuguese, but didn't know any, any Spanish directly. Said, I, did. So I said, well, what did you do? How did you manage? She said, I prayed, and then I went to the convent of Spanish nuns in Bahia, which is mentioned, the city is mentioned in the divine plan. And I showed the, the mother superior, said, what do you want? And I said, I have this book I want to translate into Spanish, but I don't know how to do it, and I need help with the Spanish, correct Spanish. She said, leave it with me and come back in a few days. I'll, I'll tell you if, if anything's possible. So she, she left the book, she came back. The woman said, oh, absolutely not. She couldn't give this whole book to any of the nuns, this is the book of certitude, you know, so she said, no, impossible. I think she got a, quite an, an eyeful herself when she read it. In any, case, in any case, she said, what we'll do is we'll divide the book up and we'll give every fourth page to different nuns and they can correct it and then we'll put it all together and you should have your book. And that's what happened and that was how she got the Extraordinary. So what else did you do, Leonore? She said, uh, she showed me a pile of newspaper clippings from all over the country from where she'd been. One of them said, Angel of Light, headline in the newspaper, Angel of Light visits the Amazon. So I said, what's that about? And she said, well, they got a little excited when I was there. I don't know. People thought I had the capacity to heal them by looking at them, and they came in great masses. <laughs> And she was. You know the master in the divine plan, he says, you should become 
incarnate light the Baha'is that are teaching how is that for one of the goals of the, of the divine plan incarnate light are you ready you look pretty bright already so <laughs> gotta start you just have to kindle that so there she was seemed to be the embodiment of that she said I, I didn't know what to do she said and some of them were, were very sick so she said I bought aspirins and cut them in half and give them an aspirin <laughs> half an aspirin to sense them. Then she says, so I gradually made my way on these river boats up the Amazon and got to Manaus. Manaus is the capital of the Amazon River. And it was the seat of the rubber barons who made so much money in the First World War. You know, they produced rubber and they became very rich. One of the things they did is they made a copy of the Paris Opera House in Manaus. And then they brought the leading opera stars to sing for their families and the people <laughs> that were interested there. Again, it's quite a miraculous story in itself. So Leonor gets there, I said, well, she said, I said, what did you do in Manaus? She said, well, I didn't know anybody. Well, I went to the mayor and I said, you know, I have a message. And he said, oh, what's your message? And after I told him, he said, this is a very important message. We'll announce a meeting, a public meeting, so the people can come and hear it from you. So by this time, she knew Portuguese well enough. And they announced this meeting that would happen, I think it was the next day in the afternoon, in the opera house. Well, I think we've all seen public meetings where you go and there's not too many people there. <laughs> So she wasn't sure just what was going to happen. She said, so I said, how many people came? She said, oh, about 2,000. <laughs> and uh, what did you do? Oh, she said, shamefully, I have to confess. I have a terrific shortcoming. I'm not a public speaker. So how did you manage? Well, she said, I, I get up and I pronounce the talks of Abdu'l-Baha from memory, and then tablets of Baha'u'llah. It seems to work pretty well. <laughs> what an example. I said, so what happened after that? She said, oh, well, we had some study classes after that. There were a few, few. How many came to the study classes? She said, only 400. <laughs> 1922, we're talking about 1921, 1922, just after the passing of the Master. Then she was in touch with Shoghi Effendi. By the time she got back to Bahia and wrote to Shoghi Effendi, she was a bit depressed that she hadn't... You know, there was nothing like enrollment then. You didn't have cards, you didn't have enrollment. If you liked the Baha'i faith, you were a Baha'i and you could stay and, pray and, and look at the writings. The next day, the mayor said after the main public meeting, he said, that's fine for the adults, but the children and youth have to hear the message too. And he arranged meetings in all of the schools for her. What a confirmation. You think she ever wrote The Guardian or anybody about this? She never did. She'd write and say, oh, Shoghi Fanny, I'm such a failure. And Shoghi Fanny would say, oh, be encouraged. Surely the seeds you're planting will grow to, you know, in the future. Friends, we've just been compiling over the last decade the messages to Latin America. It's the missing book of The Guardian's messages to the Baha'i world. And it's 450 pages long. And there's a number of, I think it's about 20, 25, 30 messages of Shoghi Effendi to Leonor Armstrong, including the fact that she, he says that the beacons of light in Bahia will shine with Baha'u'llah's blessings all over the continent. And it's, it's pr proven to be that way. And she finally passed away Years later, I mean, how many, I don't know, she had 50 years of Baha'i service there, and she passed away in Baha'i, and she's buried there. So these were the first fruits of service to the divine plan. They really set an example. And, you know, curiously enough, I mean, we believe in the oneness of religions, yet in the tablets of the divine plan, Abdu'l Baha says, your example to the Baha'is, he says, to follow are the apostles of Christ who arose and went out to different lands and gave up their lives and 
lost everything, gained everything. So this is the example he gives us. When Shoghi Effendi in 1944 wrote the history of the first Baha'i century in a book called God Passes By, which if you have not read, I hope you'll acquire and read. It's a very important vision of the cause. In the, in the chapter on teaching, he talks about the divine plan, but he balances that with paragraphs from the will and testament of Abdu'l Baha, in which he extends the responsibilities given to the North Americans to all the Baha'is of the world, so that nobody's gotten left out here. The, the Duns, as you know, of course you know the history of that better than I do, I think. Hai Dunn and his wife came to Australia. Martha Root also came on visits to Australia. So just, she just kept going round the globe, round the globe, round the globe. The first I heard of her, I was a new Baha'i, a Baha'i youth, and a Baha'i teacher took me to the home of an old man who was in a wheelchair. He was translucent, and he was another one of these light shedders, you know. He'd been a Baha'i a long time. He'd been a Baha'i when Abdul Baha came to San Francisco. He was still alive there in the, in the 50s and was so eager to tell stories. So some of the Baha'i youth, we'd get the chance to go and see him. It was a, it was a terrific occasion. He'd reach down into a, a box that had you know, 14 tablets of Abdul Baha and 30 letters of Shoghi Effendi. I don't know, he'd bring out these miraculous things and read them. And he told us, he said that Martha Root, after she had been teaching Queen Marie of Romania, and had visited more than once, the queen gave her a beautiful brooch with wings, jeweled brooch. And she was so pleased to have that. And when she returned to America, she gave it to the National Assembly of the United States to auction off for the funds for the Baha'i Temple that they were collecting at that time to build the first Mashra Galaska. And Willard Hatch was the proud winner of the, of the auction. And then he went, went on pilgrimage shortly after and was able to present that to Shoghi Effendi as a gift. And Shoghi Effendi has placed it in the International Archives, the jeweled brooch that Queen Marie gave to Martha Ruth. What a history there. I mean, you know Shoghi Effendi when Martha Root died. He said that uh, she was the all-time archetype model for the Baha'is of a, of a travel teacher, traveling teacher. Nobody could surpass her. Now, he says an example for the East and the West, men and women, young and old, white and black, the whole, there's nobody's going to surpass her. Although rival her, surely Rahia Khanum in the later years, when she came along, Shoghi Fendi said that she had the position of the greatest woman after the greatest holy leaf. Wonderful history she had of traveling all over the world. She said, one day Shoghi Effendi asked her, what will you do after I pass away? Oh my gosh, she says, Shoghi Effendi, don't, don't say that. He said, no, think about it. You pass away, you may live, outlive me, what will you do? And she said, what should I do? And he said, he said no doubt you will travel and, and visit the friends all over the world and encourage them which is exactly what she did. So she also was a great <coughs> promoter of the divine plan, if you will. Now the House of Justice says what we're doing right now in the five-year plan is a stage of the unfoldment of this divine plan. The energies that come from the divine plan are what bring us the confirmations of the Holy Spirit, enable us to go out and perform all the tasks that we want to do, but at the same time, we need to study the tablets of the divine plan. We need to understand what, what exactly we're being called on to do with respect to the, to the spirit with which we do things. 
we've got a number of the agencies of the faith now that tell us what the neat goals are at the moment, what we need to do outwardly. We participate this weekend in this and open this cluster and all kinds of things. Those are, those, those are essential. The House of Justice, when it called on the Baha'is to begin the institute process, when it made core activities for local Baha'i communities, this was not meant to substitute what had come before. It was another step. You know, the um, Guardian used to talk about, he said, when the tablets, the writings of Baha'u'llah, as they were being revealed, they released a terrific energy into the world. They infused the world with new vitality and life. But that that's so powerful that if it manifested itself all at once, it would cause us all to expire. So he says it has to gradually, in the course of the Baha'i dispensation, arise little by little. And we're still fairly early morning power of that. You know, eventually we reach the zenith that becomes the birth of the divine civilization that Shoghi Fendi has referred to in his writings. So we have infusion of the light of God, so to speak, through, through the uh, tablets and of the Bab in Baha'u'llah. Then in Abdu'l-Bah's time, he's added this mandate for teaching in the world, which is the, are the tablets of the divine plan. And he says this begins the process of diffusion of the divine light. It's been released by the twin manifestations, then the Baha'is have to carry that light and go and talk about the teachings, proclaim his message all over the world. And the crusade was the culmination, the 10-year crusade of the guardian, of the last acts of his life, really, from 1953 to 1963. And he passed away midpoint in that crusade, 1957. But the goals were all set there to for Baha'is to reach the remaining 130 countries and territories and islands of the world that are mentioned in the divine plan. The lion's share was given to the American Baha'i community, but he also said, gave specific goals in different parts of the world to the Baha'i communities that were developing in those parts. There were 12 national assemblies that participated. That was all there were in 1953 when that started. So that, that went on. Um, the success of those of that plan. Then the House of Justice came into being. We all got carried away, really, I think, with mass teaching. Exciting. More or less, we forgot what Shoghi Fendi said about expansion of the faith should go hand in hand with consolidation. And we got millions of buys and we started losing them. When the House of Justice saw that the, nobody went back to visit these people, they no longer, there were exceptions, of course, but in general, the National Assembly said, we don't know who these people are nor where they are. We can't find them anymore. And that was when the House of Justice took a serious look and started giving us a more concentrated goal of how to develop local Baha'i communities and neighborhoods to get something where you have a sound basis where there's an interaction, accompaniment between the friends, and finally adopted the urge, the adoption of the Ruhi books to help train the Baha'is to take action and continue in their services to the faith. We're still in that. We're now in the culmination of this long period, 18 years of development of, the, of these plans. And the House of Justice is asking us to make a Herculean effort. You know that word, Herculean? Hercules, you know, it's a mighty, <laughs> mighty effort that you have to arise to do uh, in order to attract many more people to the processes of the divine plan, to the processes of local consolidation, to our devotionals, to our children's classes, to the junior youth activities, to the institute course activities. All of those things need fresh recruits. And they call on us 
to make a mighty effort so that this plan will have culminate this period with uh, victories that won't get lost. So we don't want to go back to quick enrollment of people by thousands and then not have any way to keep them. The whole institute course and all the other things are there to help consolidate what we do now. But it needs a great effort. Do you remember what Abdu'l-Bah says in the divine plan? After he says, praises the Baha'is for making, making great effort, he says, but now you must increase your efforts a thousandfold. Now you think about what you're doing now and you're trying to do and you're tuckered out and your tongue is hanging out and you say, how can I do anything more than what I'm doing? And Abdu'l-Bah says, thousand times more you have to do. Well, if we didn't have the prayers of the divine plan and the promises of Baha'u'llah, we couldn't imagine how we could go forward. But he says these prayers and turning to him sincerely with sincere desire to do what God wants us to do will make a moth into an eagle, will make a fly into a I don't know, something else, and make a drop into a, an ocean. I think that, you know, pretty much, we, I mean, we can all identify with being a moth or a fly or a drop. And he says, that can be transformed into something else. Then you have the power and confirmation released in these original tablets. This infusion now starts to operate through the Baha'is. And those confirmations win victories. Friends, the guardian said, no, the Baha'is can't win victories. God wins victories. I've seen a tablet from the master. He says, the service of the friends belongs to God, not to them. There's a, there's this, a verse, a marvelous verse in the gleanings. He says, all good comes from God. And all evil from your own selves. Turn that one around on its head. All evil comes from us, and anything that's good comes from God. It doesn't come from us. We have been endowed with this blessing from God to have free will. He puts us in a world of darkness and light, and he makes us choose all the time. Do we want light or do we want darkness? How, how ready are we? And when we choose enough times light and beg him to assist us, then we can become channels of that power. Shoghi Effendi said the power in the crusade, way back in the crusade, he said that confirmations are not being drawn on sufficiently. They're under high pressure. Anybody opens their mouth a little bit, out comes this confirmation of the Holy Spirit. But if we think we're doing it, of course, it has no effect. So we have to count on him. Shoghi Effendi in his own letters, which I think, you know, sir, the House of Justice compiled these, and uh, published them in a compilation called The Power of Divine Assistance. I think that uh, m my impression, if we read that, we'll, we'll see that the admonitions are in three categories. The first one is how do you, you initially are going to respond to this divine power. And Jogi Effendi says, if you turn to your own weaknesses, and limitations, you will be paralyzed and unable to do anything. Well, I think, you know, when we're honest with ourselves and we look at ourselves, we're miserable. Not very, I mean, I don't know about you, but I know about me. <laughs> you have no hope. How could you ever do anything? You didn't have enough education. You're not handsome enough. You're not rich enough. You don't have any Lamborghini to drive around to impress the people. We, we go back to the materialistic standards of this wretched age we live in, really, materialism. The Guardian says it's the greatest enemy of the cause, this imagination that the people have that by accumulation of material things, their position gets better. And they ignore acquiring these eternal virtues that come through turning and trying to assist God in creating a new planet, a new kingdom, if you will, on earth. First, ignore those doubts you have about yourself. 
And if you say, well, I would teach the faith, but I've done some things in my life that I don't think God can forgive. Oh, think again. <laughs> Mirza Yahya, there's a paragraph towards the end of the Actas which says, if you turn sincerely in repentance, you'll be forgiven. This is the man that poisoned the manifestation of God, tried to murder him. I don't think we can come up with anything to rival that kind of evil. So forget about your shortcomings and what you've done that you're not happy with. You don't have to tell anybody about it, but try to move towards the name of God, the ever-forgiving, the most-forgiving, the all-forgiving. Can you, can you find something that doesn't fit in those categories that he can't handle? I don't think so. What do we do if we don't look at our own faults? What are we supposed to do? Then he comes to the next principle, the admonition. He says... You must hold to the divine promises. Review, outline, draw out of the tablets those phrases, those where he promises. If anyone arises in the service of the cause, a host of divine angels will assist them. That his words will go and take influence in the hearts of people. I didn't see any place in all the instructions over the years that says, Oh, people, arise and distribute pamphlets. <laughs> what does Abdu'l-Bah say? He says, Abdu'l-Bah says, Oh, people, arise and breathe life into the souls of others. And he says, How can the poor give to the poor? You have to enrich yourself first, which is exactly what Baha'u'llah says in the Akdas. He calls on us to arise to teach the cause of God. And he says, those who arise must before all else teach their own selves from the tablets. In other words, we have to be deepening all the time in the words and verses of God. Is that causes a change in us. <coughs> that produces the possibility of our placing our confidence in him. Third admonition, he says, act. Arise and act. And Shoghi Effendi, in repeating these, he always adds the phrase, and persevere in action. So we kind of slow down, you know, sometimes we get going, then we don't, we're not steady in it. And we need to be sacrificial. And that's another word he adds perseverance and sacrifice. The guardian used to tell the pilgrims that. The cause moves forward. The fuel of the cause to make it go, go forward is sacrifice. Now, if I'm, uh, I don't know how you understand that, but I, I think sacrifice means doing the things you don't think you can do. You know, we all say, well, I've got, you know, I've got the budget, so I can sacrifice this much money for the fund. Or I have this much time or besides my personal goals in life, I can take part in the activities, whatever amount of time is suggested. If we all do that, the cause maintains itself, but it doesn't go forward. We have to do what we think we can't do. We have to sacrifice more. In three areas, the guardian says sacrifice is essential. One, in finance, in giving contributing to the funds of the faith till it hurts. Second, the contribution of our time. doesn't sound like a very important contribution, but nothing will happen in the cause if we don't give time to these goals and to trying to, to accomplish these things. In trying to enact and embody, if you will, these promises that Baha'u'llah has made. Now, you know, he says with one one act, one verse, he can transform all humanity. The fact that he doesn't do that is a terrific blessing for us. Because he lets we, all we little people, be the means of promoting his cause in the world after he's left. Is there any greater bounty? Abdu'l-Bahá says, the greatest gift of God is the gift of teaching, the fact that we can teach, the fact that we are allowed to 
try to quicken other souls through the teachings by proclaiming the cause of God. Several passages he says, O people, arise and proclaim the cause of God. If someone responds to that message, teach them. Interesting. This is not the first thing is teaching. We're just making people know there's a new message from God. Baha'u'llah lies its author. And maybe we say a few things about the teachings. But the people, Shoghi Effendi said, need to hear the name Baha'i and Baha'u'llah. They have the potential in their hearts to recognize. There's some waiting souls that are immediate, immediate response. Maybe they'll even beat you up. Why didn't you tell me before about this? It's so important. I didn't know you'd be interested. What? <laughs> if we don't meet them here, we're going to meet them in the next world, the ones we didn't tell, and they're going to say, what? You set me back an eternity. Why didn't you tell me I was your neighbor for 10 years and you didn't tell me about the faith? So not teaching everybody, but telling them that such a thing exists. That should awaken curiosity sufficient that you follow through with more or invite them to a devotional meeting or whatever it is, or some kinds of things. So what we had infusion in Baha'u'llah's time, diffusion of the light through Abdul Baha's ministry and through the guardian period of the guardianship and into these early decades of the House of Justice service. And now we're starting another process which Shoghi Vendi called suffusion of the divine light. The light spreads over the surface, now it has to penetrate into the very lives and institutions and activities of society everywhere. And that's more or less this neighborhood struggle that we're having, to try to get everything going in a number of places all over the world. It's working pretty well in Papua New Guinea and in the Congo, but I don't know, in the big cities it's more challenging. Now we're supposed to have reflection meetings where we think about these things and try to figure out how can we do it better. And the House of Justice has given us lots of suggestions. I hear Baha'i saying they're running, they run out of energy. They do all they can. <coughs> Nothing seems to happen. As far as I can understand, friends, from these wonderful teachings from Baha'u'llah, the tablets and things. You, we need to have a daily interaction with the divine verses. And I've seen some letters from Shoghi Effendi. He says to new Baha'is, he said, I hope you will take your leisure time to make a very concentrated study of the writings of Baha'u'llah. Another place he says, he hopes you will find a a couple hours a day to read the divine writings of Baha'u'llah. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands how many people read the writings two hours a day. I thought that's a terrific thing. That could really change me if I did that. And I started doing it, but about ten minutes into the process I fall asleep. So <laughs> it doesn't, it's not very promising. But I try. Over we need to read hidden words, the Master says, morning and evening. We need to memorize hidden words. We need to memorize prayers. Our spiritual life is the foundation upon which then we're able to move in the world. Then we act after that. So prayer and meditation and study of the writings are the three factors in our Baha'i experience that enable us to take effective action. And action is the fourth. Prayer meditation, study of the writings, and action are the four things which can provide effective service and teaching work that results, gives results according to the promises of God. We all have to ask ourselves, how much preparation do we do? Are we just, it's wonderful if we're inspired and we trust in the Holy Spirit, but Baha'u'llah has told us, teach yourself first before you teach others. That, obviously, is taking too long. So Shoghi Effendi says, teach and study. These are, interact with each other. Because when you want to teach, people will ask you questions, and you don't know the answer to that. 
I remember the early in the 50s, the hands of the cause were saying, please don't answer, don't guess the answer from when <laughs> you don't know it. It doesn't hurt anything to say the Baha'i teachings covers all kinds of things, all kinds of topics. And I think I can find an answer. I'll find an answer for you and I'll tell you next week or something. But Shoghi Finney says, when we first start out, we have favorite subjects and we add our own ideas and that kind of, you know, dilutes the water of influence. It doesn't taste quite like it came out of the original can, you know. We've <laughs> added our own something flavors to it. Stage one of a Baha'i teacher. Stage two of a Baha'i teacher, he says, is when you've studied the writings enough, you can give them in their pure form in your own words. In other words, you're not citing verses from memory, but you, you give an accurate portrayal of it, of the cause when you're telling somebody about it or when they ask about some aspect of it, you're able to answer that. The third stage, and this is the one that Leonor Armstrong started with, is to memorize characteristic passages from the writings. And I think those passages are the ones that Shoghi Fendi has quoted in all of his writings provided us with so that in our teaching work we can offer those teachings to the people from memory. That he said Shoghi Fendi says has the greatest power to touch the hearts of the people. So a, a lot of the effectiveness of what we do in the cause requires our study <coughs> and concentration of it. And if you're not attracted to it well, then start to pray, because you should be attracted to it, and we're not necessarily. There are times in our lives when we're so distracted by the life we're trying to live that we need to ask, help me, Baha'u'llah, to fulfill what your requirements are. It says in the beginning of the Akdas, you remember that so clearly, he says, first duty for man is to recognize the manifestation of God. And the next one is to put into practice his teachings in our lives. Either one without the other is not acceptable. That's a big challenge for all of us. Well, let's all pray for each other that we can awaken to another stage of perception in the cause that will enable us to sacrifice money, time, and the third element, which I didn't, I skipped earlier, I'll get back to it, he says, is our personal goals in life. We give up some things that we would like to do with our lives in order to give our time and our wealth to the cause. But we never lose through that process. You know, Baha'u'llah, Abdu Baha, they talk about tenfold return of efforts that are made with sincerity in the cause. I'm sure people in this room can tell us histories of how, that, how that's happened in their lives. So even he said, you know, the Baha'is sometimes think that they're very needed for the cause. He said, uh, it's the opposite. The cause doesn't need you. All us is to raise up pebbles. If we don't do it, we have an opportunity. Let us take that opportunity. Okay, you also add a little prayer on the end of your devotion said, God, please forgive Mr. Dunbar that his words exceed his deeds. <laughs> because I'm giving you all kinds of good advice here. I hope I follow it myself and think about it. It's, it's a serious business, you know. <laughs> all right, friends, I don't know. How long did I talk too long? Or enough words? Enough, yeah. If you have a few questions and put in writing, I could try to address them. I'll be happy to tell you that I don't know the answer, or if I can think of something, I'll try to give you that. Thank you. If anybody has to go home to re re release the babysitter or something, please feel free to.
Let me just say you're not obliged to ask questions. <laughs> So this is an, an interesting question. I think this is on the minds of many of us, and I don't know an easy answer. It's, it says, the friends often wish to befittingly commemorate the holy days in such a way as to be inclusive of all. Families with young children, friends from the wider community, the Persian elderly. It is possible to have a perfect program. Is it possible? Sometimes it's said that we must em emulate the nature and content of holy days at the Baha'i World Center, readings, tablets, prayers, so on. Is it suitable to emulate the program which we are trying, when we are trying to be sensitive to all participants, especially the wider community? This, I think it's a good subject for your reflection meetings. But it's, it's particular. It's particular. It's particularly important this year that you get at it because you've got these twin birthdays coming up, the 200th anniversary, which the house has asked us to create new programs, especially at the local level, to invite our friends and our contacts and relatives, and it it presents an excuse to invite them. You know that we're having this commemoration, this celebration, anniversary of the birth of these two divine teachers that have come to the world. I don't know what your plan is. Our local community, where I am in California, they were trying to figure out what to do. They wanted to have a big commemoration of all of us together. And all of us together are about 60 people anyway. It's not very many. So, And then also to fulfill the neighborhood meetings. And the assembly consulted about this. My wife is the chairman of the local assembly. She comes home from the meeting. I say, so honey, how did the meeting go? She says, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to speak about that. <laughs> But other members of the assembly told me <laughs> that they've decided one day of one of the birthdays to have these local activities and one day to have a cluster collective large bash meeting to commemorate one of the two birthdays. I, don't, I didn't get straight which is which, but it sounded like an interesting idea. You might want to reflect on that in the, in the challenges that you have. Could you please share some thoughts about how we, especially youth, can develop coherence between different aspects of our lives, service, study, work, family life, perennial challenge? Again, friends, whatever you decide, those are your goals, those are your personal goals in life and so on, very important. But once you've decided them, figure out how you can sacrifice some portion of those so that the cause will move forward. This, I, I can't tell you how nice it is to see things so well written, little printed messages here. Some, some places I go, I can't read the questions, you know. <laughs> Bad enough to not know the answer, but you can't read the question. <laughs> well, 
So I'll read the question. That'll be a guessing game. You'll try to figure out who that is. I'm new to Brisbane, and I was wondering how you manage to involve yourself in every community you visit. Well, probably fortunately I don't. I, <laughs> I get to speak to meetings like this, but that doesn't involve me with the local activities. I asked because I wasn't very active in my old community. I want to do better, and I don't know where to start. Uh, maybe Advent of Divine Justice is an interesting place to start if you, have, if you want to read something that tells us what are the prerequisites for service to the cause and taking part in community life. What's your advice for someone going to serve at the World Center regarding preparing to go there and coming back when your service is over? Uh, lots of prayers. It's a challenge. It's not easy to serve there. I read something after I was there a while uh, because apparently you're out of the activities of the faith when you're there. You know, you're doing your services and you're gardening, but there doesn't seem to be much else going on. And when we went to the teaching center, came uh, my wife was serving with her Heokonom, helping her with her photo collection and things. But at night, there wasn't anything going on. And we had been very kind of into it, activities every night and on the weekends in South America, and we missed it a lot. And somehow watching old... Arab movies on the television, which was all there was to watch, <laughs> didn't satisfy us. <laughs> now, friends go there, sometimes they have an illusion, and if they don't have the illusion, their parents have the illusion, we send you there and we all get fixed. <laughs> now, the House of Justice said, mercy, mercy, don't send your you know, troubled children to us, try to <laughs> <laughs> send people that will be useful, the kids that will be useful. <laughs> now, there is a level of devotion, however, at the World Center. The example of the members of the institutions and, and friends coming and pilgrims coming, and everyone's very moved when they come and go. So, what to do? Uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge, for tic particularly the youth. We got to mentioning to the youth, meeting them before they went back, to say, you know, be patient with your communities because they've been serving full time. They go back and they see that the Baha'is at the local level oftentimes don't have that kind of dedication that the people at the World Center have. So they get discouraged with, how shall we do that? And they end up calling ex-World Center people and they have their friendships amongst them because they all understand this problem that they have when they come back and they can't find sufficient devotion in the community. But this isn't a, a problem that has to be, I mean, we have to involve ourselves. And surely we can't imagine, having had the blessing of serving in the World Center, that we're better than anybody else. That's not going to work. So I suggest that uh, you be patient with them, because it's very discouraging when you say, you know, in the World Center, I don't, we don't want to hear what they do in the World Center. This is Brisbane, don't you understand? You know? <laughs> Oh, the Guardian calls Baha'is in this generation the generation of half-light, of the half-light, in some passages. Are we still Baha'is of the half-light? Or now three-quarters light? <laughs> Do we need to wait until the golden age to be full lights? <laughs> I don't think I want to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> let us strive to be a generation of the half-light. At least let's get up to the half-light. The kids in Haifa, some of the youth said in Haifa, you know, well, what, how, how, what, how, what's our, what should be our attitude towards the laws and teachings of the faith? You know, some, some people had the idea, well, you know, the world is doing this. Baha'u'llah says to do this. And there's a, quite
quite a difference between the two, <laughs> behavior-wise and everything we need to do. <clears throat> so, one gets the idea with the word moderation that we should be somewhere between the standard of Baha'u'llah and the standard of the world. I think that's a mistake in case you've gone anywhere like that in your mind. I think you need to rethink that. In the middle is lukewarm. One is full-on warmth, heat of, of the revelation, and the other is this coolness of just doing what the world wants us to do. So there's a verse from the New Testament that says, as to the lukewarm, God will spew them out of his mouth. But that doesn't sound like very pleasant activity. So. <laughs> so the only thing I could suggest is that moderation in the Baha'i faith means not doing more than Baha'u'llah asks. You know? <laughs> I'm happy to report to you I'm out of questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>